now to Kate and Amy. Amy uh, and I are going to talk about Amplified Publishing today. So I'm Kate Pullinger. I'm Professor of Creative Writing and Digital Media at Baspa University. So I'm a novelist and I work with digital media as well. Um, and I also run the Center for Cultural and Creative Industries at, at Baspa, which is a research center, uh, which is part of the Bristol and Bath Creative R&D Partnership, which is uh, the people behind Amplified Publishing. I am a uh, white woman with um, longish white hair and I am wearing glasses and some blue clothes and my new blue starfish. Um, Amy, do you want to introduce yourself, please? Yeah, um, I'm Amy Spencer. I'm a postdoctoral researcher based at Bath Spa University. Um, I'm also part of the Amplified Publishing Project um, and I'm also a writer. I, uh, in terms of visual description, I am a white woman with brown hair and blue eyes. I'm wearing a blue cardigan and I'm in quite a, a plain room um, with not too much going on behind me. Back to Kate. Thanks, Amy. So yeah, we're gonna talk about Amplified Publishing. We're about nine months, eight or nine months into what is basically a, a year long, a year long program. Uh, funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council, the, the AHRC here in the UK. And it's part of the Bristol and Bath Creative R&D Partnership, which is a four year project that we are now in the last year of. So um, bristolbathcreative.org is um, the project website if you want to have a look at that. Um, we're gonna talk about the project overall and how we're working with researchers from both industry and academia. And we're gonna talk a bit as well about the, the three, um, hopefully really exciting prototypes that, um, that we've, we funded just before Christmas, uh, as well as the industry facing report that, that Amy's writing currently on um, the future of publishing. So we chose this theme uh, for, uh, uh, for the cluster because uh, we felt it, it fit really well to the region. Uh, in, within the creative industries in the region, publishing is, um, well, at least pre-pandemic, uh, was or is the largest employer. So um, we, we, we wanted to take this, this theme of um, the future of publishing and expand it or amplify it across multiple sectors. So we were interested in looking at um, publishing, not just traditional books, um, uh, and magazines, but much more broadly across the music industry, uh, the way that games publishers, games de developers publish into the game space, and hoping to, to find a way to think about what we can learn from, from other sectors. We had four large partners um, who we could um, talk to and whose expertise we could draw on. Uh, they were BT, Epic Games, who, as you know, are behind Fortnite and also um, the Unreal Game Engine, a BBC R&D, who've really supported the cluster program throughout the last, um, the last, the last three years, and also Future. Um, so Future is a Bath-based uh, global company. Uh, and I thought it would just be interesting just to, to talk a little bit about Future here. Um, because it's, it's an interesting story in and of itself. So it was founded in Somerset in, in 1985 by Chris Anderson, who, as you know, um, after that went on to create TED Talks and, and the whole TED empire. Um, and Future grew rapidly from that early stage, publishing mainly kind of games and computer computing consumer magazines. So their first publication was um, Amstrad Action, so if you're as old as I am, you might remember that. Um, Anderson left in, in 2001 and the, the company sort of went along the same trajectory as many magazine companies did uh, during the noughties and into the early teens of this century, century which is essentially kind of running into trouble. And um, you know, the, the future of the print magazine at that point was looked a bit uncertain. But in 2016, they began to kind of turn it around with a series of um, fairly substantial acquisitions across print and digital, buying up other publishers. Uh, and in, even in 2020, the, the parent company of the price comparison website, um, Go Compare. 
So now Future um, thinks of itself as a data and technology company. And if you look at their website, you, you, you're hard pressed to find the word publisher or publishing. Instead, they, they say we operate at the heart of content, community and commerce. Um, so I, I wanted to just mention Future as, as one of our partners, not because Amy and I are advocating that we all become global e-commerce and IP companies like Future. But part of what we've learned through the work that we've done with the research fellow cohort, and Amy's going to talk a bit, bit more about that in a minute, um, is that these three things, content, community, and commerce, um, in particular, the ability to create content that will engage your community in order to make a living as a creator, that, um, that key item, um, are at the heart of what we've been trying to look at in this theme. And as you know, it's, it's really difficult to make a living as a creator these days. Um, surveys consistently show that, uh, for instance, writers, the, the sector that I dwell in normally, um, you know, incomes have taken a, a, a terrible hit uh, over the last 12 years leading up to the pandemic, writers' incomes dropped by 49% surveys show so you know it's really tough out there for anybody who's trying to create content that's not news that's not news to any of us but we hope that this project will provide some useful thinking uh, that might you know help the sector somewhat uh, we've been publishing a whole lot of blog posts and articles our research cohort has been um, writing and thinking and uh, you can find those on the website that i mentioned mentioned earlier um, so I'm going to hand over to Amy now, who's going to talk a bit about um, our research cohort, our fellows who are a mix of people from industry and academia. Over to you, Amy. Thanks, Kate. Um, so we began this Pathfinder with the knowledge that publishing had changed, content creation's changed, um, and has expanded, it's grown through new publishing models, uh, changes, developments in technology, uh, new global platforms, um shifting audience needs expectations changes in the attention that we as media consumers um give to platforms and rapid innovation across multiple sectors um and we began with the understanding that um all different types of creators so if you're um, starting a youtube channel you're starting a podcast a game a platform an immersive vr experience uh, one of the main challenges that you'll be facing is you're trying to find an audience uh, we began to identify and think about what publishers and content creators across all these different forms might need, what their ambitions are, and the challenges that they might face. Uh, so as part of this, to try and understand all these issues, all these things that everybody's been thinking about, we put out an open call for a cohort of research fellows to join us, as well as the major industry partners that Kate mentioned. Um, so we, we started by looking for new talent fellows, academic fellows, inclusion fellows, industry fellows, as well as industry partners. So a whole broad range of people that we wanted to work alongside um, as we researched and thought about what we're doing. So with this cohort of, of researchers, we meet regularly as a group uh, for in-depth discussions around emerging themes, and this informs our research. So we um, have guest speakers who come in and talk, um, members of the cohort, the researchers in the cohort, um, share what they've been doing, update on their progress on their own research projects. So it's a really lively group of people that we work with. Um, can I have slide two, please? So this slide is um, when, if there's a slide, anyway. Uh, so slide two uh, is a live illustration from a panel of some of our research fellows. Hopefully you'll see that in a minute. But it just, it's just to illustrate the broad range of conversations and discussions that we have. Um, and the ideas that we've been grappling with. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to introduce you to a few of the fellows, um, highlight some of their thinking and um, explore how, how they've become part of the project and what they're doing. So as a cohort, they've spent their time um, making, thinking, challenging um, new ways of old ways of working, finding solutions to problems, as well as being really generous and sharing their ideas with each other. Um, we've begin to, begun to see lots of different uh, ways of working, kind of new experimental ways of working, and lots of different themes have emerged. I'm not gonna mention all of the, all of the fellows because that would, that would take quite a long time, um, but I'm gonna highlight a few of them and I'm gonna focus on um, 
some of the areas and some of the themes that have been um, emerging. So the themes particularly are content, community and commerce. And these have been um, kind of re-emerging themes that have been bubbling up as we've been going along. So hopefully you'll 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 see evidence of that in, in some of um, what we're talking about. So as Kate mentioned, each of these research fellows have been writing blog posts. So each has written a blog post um, for us on the research, which we've published on the Bristol and Bath Creative R&D website. And we'll share those links for you in the chat so you can find out more about what they've been doing. Um, I think they're excellent examples of the development of the research themes, and they give you a really good understanding of what people are thinking about in the sector at the moment. So I'm going to uh, first talk about one of the fellows, uh, Vinay Nambudiri. So Vinay is a lecturer in the computer science department at the University of Bath. Um, he is focused on visual computing and developing uh, novel AI and vision techniques uh, for use within the creative industries for content creation. So his research is particularly around AI um, and how he might use AI to generate illustrations and images for publishing in books. So a really, I think a really interesting um, way of thinking about content creation using AI to do that. So you have a look at, um, hopefully the, the link's been uh, posted in the chat so you can take a look at what he's been thinking about in much more depth. We've also got Linus Harrison. Um, he is an R&D project lead, uh, social entrepreneur and uh, neuro, neuro, neurodivergent visual thinker. So he's focusing on uh, using spatial imagery to um, within publishing. So through his research, he's been exploring how you might personalize content, how you might use technology to personalize content in serving underrepresented audiences. So if you take a look at his blog post, you'll see in a lot more depth what he's been working and, and a lot of the thinking behind the way he's been working. Uh, we've also been working with Complete Control, um, who are a leading children's interactive production company based in Bath. They specialize in um, digital content for young audiences, for children um, in particular. So their, their vision is to try and create the most imaginative, innovative and playful digital experiences for the younger generation. So we had one of um, their colleagues, Carolina Latka, who had been thinking about researching personalization and interactivity um, in digital content for children. So that took up our research in a really interesting direction, thinking about um, how you might personalize content, um, particularly for younger audiences, was, which was a theme that's kind of emerged through quite a few of the fellows that we've been working with. Um, we've also been working with Grace Cress, who um, some of you might know is founder of Shelby X Studios, which is a, an online platform that combines art and activism. Um, and she, uh, part of her wider aim is to build communities of care, uh, uh, amplify radical messages, and imagine a world without systems of oppression. Um, her research, particularly with us, um, has been around what we might learn from independent zine production and how they can help us think about future of publishing. So thinking about how independent um, publishing can influence wider publishing. We've also been working with Sammy Jones, a freelance journalist who has published across um, lots of different uh, media forms she has been thinking about how content um, sections in digital media platforms can often be really toxic places. And she's rethinking those um, as uh, spaces for constructive dialogue. And I know that she's giving uh, um, one of these talks on that, I think potentially next week. So I'd have a look and catch up on that. Um, we've been working with Crack Magazine. So they're one of our industry partners. Um, the biggest independent free monthly uh, music magazine in Europe. So um, they've been set up to uh, uh, amplify a diverse range of uh, voices, um, identities and sound. They have rethought themselves, reimagined themselves during the pandemic as a digital magazine. So their editor, Louise Braley, has been thinking about the potential of a digital magazine to grow a hub of supporters. So thinking um, around this idea of building community and doing that particularly through a digital magazine. We've been working with uh, Jasmine Richards, who is a, um, she's an author of children's books. So she's written 15 books for children and she's the founder of Story Mix, which is a production company that creates um, narratives with an inclusive range of characters. So through her work, she has been exploring inclusive and equitable creation 
and thinking particularly about audio content in children's publishing. Uh, we've also been um, talking to James Binns, he's one of our research fellows. He is the co-founder of a Bath-based Bath games media group called Network N, which operates um, across a broad range of different media types. He's been thinking about how audiences discover content, how they extend their reach, and how they might generate income. Um, we've also been working with um, Tom Abba. He's one of our research fellows. He is a writer and an artist, and he's been thinking, um, extending his work particularly around digital and physical books, thinking about hybrid forms um, across different types of media and thinking about the potential of innovative business models for the independent publishing sector. And so it's a kind of an introduction to several of our fellows, which we have many, many fellows. Um, and hopefully you will be able to have a look at their blog posts and you'll get much more of a sense of, of exactly what they've been doing. Um, I'm gonna hand over to Kate now for, the, for a bit more um, background on the prototypes. Thanks, Amy. And as you can probably tell, we're we're still having a few little is issues. So, and that is it's made me laugh because um, we were asked to to have slides that didn't have any text on them, and the one slide that we that has text on it got stuck there. So, <laughs> apologies, apologies for that. Um, uh, but um, Jack, if you could take us through to slide ten, that would be great. So I'm going to, um, to talk about uh, the prototypes now. Um, we had a fund for um, three pro prototypes uh, coming out of Amplified Publishing. And um, it's, uh, although they're, they're only just getting started on their projects, um, I hope that um, just in some brief, brief descriptions that I'll give you, you'll see how all three of these prototypes, we hope will you know, address aspects of um, the, the um, creating content, um, how to connect with the communities that we work and live in, and as well as the potential for um, creating commerce, for creating income for creators um, in, in three very different ways. So um, slide 10, yeah, that's the right slide. Thanks, Jack. Is, um, so our first prototype that I'll just mention is Lost Horizon. And this is really about a, creating a digital twin for live performance. Um, so Lost Horizon will, will um, deliver, and like I said, the, we're at the beginning of this process and um, these prototypes will be launched at the end of April. So they're gonna deliver a scalable content delivery platform for publishing and distributing live and on-demand music performance and visual art. They'll develop a 3D immersive so social VR and gaming environment as a digital twin of their real life venue to prototype a new digital economic model for the music, entertainment, and live sector. So a bit ambitious, as you can see, but, but really exciting. Lost Horizon comes out of the festival, the music festival sector. Uh, they um, run Shangri-La at, at, at Glastonbury and made an amazing pivot to digital uh, during the pandemic and now have a venue in, in Bristol. So we hope that this project, which is a kind of alternative grassroots metaverse, will help creators find new ways to get their work in front of um, new audiences. So um, next slide, please. Uh, so the second prototype comes from a, uh, a business in Bath called, called Network N, and they're going to bring us follower TV. So, what we're hoping for here is a better way for creators to reach their fans, to find new audiences and to monetize their content. If you think about all the places online that um, where creators distribute their content, whether that's Twitch or YouTube or TikTok or Instagram, et cetera, um, you know, sharing content across all these pl platforms is, it remains surprisingly difficult. So Follower TV will create channels uh, where creators can pull together all the content that they produce into a single chronological flow. So if you are a fan of whoever, you log on to their Follower TV channel and you'll see chronologically what they've posted to their various social media feeds. Uh, so it's a kind of social media aggregator for the 21st century. Uh, 
and uh, we've got we've got big hopes for what it might do in terms of enabling and enabling creators to um, to speak really directly to their audience across multiple platforms. So slide twelve, please. Uh, the next slide, Jack. Stormjar. Uh, so Stormjar are creating a new horror social content creation experience called the Nightmare Auction, where monsters trade the nightmares of humankind. The project will build a community around nightmares that will then become different forms of co content. So for example, um, maybe a game demo, a short film, or some kind of digital experience. So this project builds on the popularity of horror fiction and horror fan fiction, creepypasta, and the world of uh, online writing communities. It's fairly under wraps, Currently, so stay tuned for further updates. And like I said, all three of these projects will be launched at our showcase event on the 29th of April. That'll be a day long event. Uh, it'll be both in person and, and online. Um, so please, um, if you're interested, save the date and um, these prototypes will be revealed at that time. So um, back, back to you, Amy. Thank you. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the research report that I've been putting together. Um, I'm working with the research cohort and the prototype teams to understand the impact of technology and innovation on publishing and content creation across all different forms. So putting together a report um, that's looking at the next 10 years of publishing. So thinking about where we're going to be in 20, uh, 2030. Um, it's really broad, uh, particularly as there's going to be lots of challenges and changes um economically socially ecologically over that time um yeah who knows what things are going to look like by then so it's very broad um but the report that i'm putting together is going to be industry focused so it's going to be um offering lots of insights from the pathfinder the cohort the prototypes um and what we think will benefit the industry um broad the broad sense of the industry so publishing content creation um, it's going to be a way to share the knowledge that we've generated through the project and hopefully have a much wider impact. It's going to be uh, future facing, so it's going to not just it's not going to outline what we've been doing in the project, but it's going to be thinking about changes and challenges within the sector, uh, thinking about our predictions for the future of publishing and content creation. It's going to be informed by experts. Um, by that, I mean it's going to be um, informed by the breadth of the people that we've been working with and the experiences of people involved in the Pathfinder and our wider networks. So it's going to, um, my research for the project is including um, extensive interviews with, you know, everybody that we've been working with so far, but also looking outside the network um, and interviewing um, key players in, in the sector. So our major industry partners, as well as publishers, creators, distributors, um, games developers, a huge range of people. Um, uh, it's going to be an accessible, practical, um, readable and creative report. Um, that's what I'm hoping. Uh, so far, I've been in a research phase um, alongside the cohort, which has been a really great experience, um, understanding the, the breadth of the field and trying to work out where the edges are. Um, as I said, it's a, it's a really broad, um, a, a broad topic that we've been thinking about. So the edges aren't clearly defined. So that's what I've been working in. Um, I've been looking at VR and publishing, um, the history of di digital innovation in publishing, as well as um, uh, concepts like discoverability, personalization, and business models. So that's a kind of starting point. Um, the structure of the report is going to be thinking around these newly commissioned prototypes, uh, thinking about the themes that they're working through, um, bringing their um, creators into the discussion. Uh, it's particularly going to focus around uh, create creation and content. Uh, thinking about tools for creators. So I'm going to bring in the ideas of some of our research fellows, for example, Linus Harrison. Um, his work on personalization for underrepresented audiences is going to come in there. Um, some of the ideas from Complete Control and their research into personalization uh, for, for children. I'm going to think a lot about commerce, so income generation, business models, uh, creative approaches. It's going to think about um, challenging old ways of working and traditional business models. So it's going to 
build on some of the research from, um, for example, in our cohort, Jasmine, uh, thinking about audio publishing, some of our research from James in Network N around um, search, uh, searchability, thinking about Tom Abbott's research into independent publishing. Um, it's also going to focus on community, how we might build community around a creator and how the creator can, be can become a brand. Um, so in this, I'll be thinking about some of the research that's come out of Crack Magazine around digital publishing, um, becoming hubs for, for creators, uh, and some of um, Sammy Jones' research into the comment sections and the kind of how to build uh, fair and friendly comment sections and some of Grace's ideas around um, how we might learn from self-published activist communities. So there's a, there's a huge range. There isn't a kind of uh, limit on the research that we've been doing and the report that's going to be pulling all that together in hopefully a, a readable and um, wide-reaching way. I'm going to pass back over to Kate now. Thanks Amy. Um, we can go to the last slide. Uh, so it, just to, just to summarize, you know, through this Pathfinder, what, what we've been learning is, um, you know, the, the, it's not rocket science really that, you know, finding ways to make a living finding ways to create new, to, to reach new audiences and finding ways to create and connect with community uh, are all intertwined. Um, technology makes some of this easier. Technology makes some of this more complicated. Um, but we hope that um, you'll, have a, you'll have a look at the, at the web pages that um, you, you should see some links to in, in the chat. And we hope that our, our researchers uh, through these blog posts and other activity and the prototypes that we're, we've invested in um, can help to, uh, to further this conversation. So um, apologies again for our technical difficulties, but um, hopefully uh, you've learned a bit about what we're trying to achieve with um, Amplified Publishing. So um, any questions? Hey, Amy, thank you so much. And uh, thanks for um, delivering in such a confident and clear fashion, despite all the tech issues that we've had today. Um, our technician, Jack, has been working valiantly in the background to wrangle all manner of tech gremlins. So thanks all of you for your patience, especially with the sound issues earlier on there. So it's Q&A time for those of you out there who want to ask questions. And we've got our first question in the chat already. Um, interesting question. If you were to run the Pathfinder again, what might you change? Kate, I'll give you that one. Oh, I, there would be no pandemic. And, <laughs> and we would get to meet in person, which we have never done. So, you know, that I think for this, for Bristol and Bath Creative R&D overall, the pandemic, that business of having to shift everything online and, and to create a cohort of researchers and prototype developers who have not met in person has been really challenging. Uh, you know, we've done it, uh, but um, we've tried a couple of times to, to do in-person events and we've had to cancel them. It's been really frustrating. So if I ran it again, I would love to do it without a pandemic. <laughs> I, think, I think, you know, I think brainstorming is, is so much more fun when you're in the room together, uh, really. I think that is one thing that we've all learned, isn't it? Yes, hopefully the time for connection and face-to-face -face collaboration is approaching swiftly for all of us. Um, and hopefully we can all be navigate ways to make sure those that can't meet face-to-face -face can continue to collaborate as well. Um, I wonder um, if I might ask, um, what, what do you feel like the world of Amplified Publishing will look like in five years' time? Yeah, that's part of what Amy's trying to look at really is the next five, five to 10 to 15 to 15 years. Um, you know, I think for me personally, that I've been really interested in the, in the smartphone and the way in which the smartphone has um, enabled some experimentation and, and, and also kind of the way that the smartphone mobile has um, broadened audiences and um, brought people, you know, made, made, made things much more accessible on the web uh, for many more people. But of course, the futurologists say that the smartphone is on its way out and that it's, it's all going to be about wearables, including a kind of re rebirth, if that's the right word, of glasses, of um, glasses that have augmented reality uh, technology embedded in them. Um, so 
I, I think that that will continue to shift and change. But I think that th this essential problem of getting your work seen, finding ways to make a living, and finding ways to expand your 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 audience and what you're trying to achieve as a creator, those problems will those problems will never go away, just no matter what the, how the technology develops. So. Um, hopefully what we find in our research will will continue to to apply. Amy, anything to add to that? I yeah, know just agreeing that that's definitely where um, a lot of my research is thinking around how how to generate income and how people can um, make a living from work. I've been doing a lot of thinking and reading around VR at the moment um, and how that might open up new ways of, of, of working and thinking and publishing. Um, I have no firm conclusions yet. <laughs> I'm, I'm really interested in what's happening with the, the ideas around the decentralized web mm -hmm. and whether that will allow us to escape from the corporations that control so much of the internet these days, um, which you know is something that's become more and more uh, of, a, of a kind of um, thing over the last decade. Uh, so um, yeah, I think that uh, that's something worth keeping keeping your eye on as well. There's a number of rabbit holes we could dive down there. Uh, VR and the decentralized web. Um, I guess maybe let's start with VR. Amy, do you have a sense of how Amplified Publishing might exist in a world where VR is more accessible, well, accessible is the wrong word, but more easily available um, to people, especially with the kind of the, the existence of Quest 2? Um, what's your sense that as a futurologist, futurologist maybe? Oh no, this is <laughs> I, <laughs> the time. I don't I think I'm working my way to being a futurologist. <laughs> I, don't uh, I don't I don't know if I can predict exactly yet. Kate might have more um, more of a sense. It just feels like the projects come at a really interesting time that lots of things have been thrown up all in the air, partly because of the pandemic, partly because of um the metaverse <laughs> you know lots of things are happening all at the same time they're kind of um vr becoming more popular suddenly you know it's been in kind of emerging for a while but suddenly there's sort of a second wind um of vr at the moment it's a really interesting time where everything's been thrown up in the air um so a lot of my work's been kind of grappling with with changes but also not trying to go down too many kind of rabbit holes and getting um, yeah, thinking about too many things in too much detail, trying to do a, a kind of a broad sweep of everything. Um, so I don't think I can specifically answer your question without in a year somebody saying you are completely <laughs> <laughs> this is a, this, yeah, this, this, yeah, Kate might have more, more of a sense of this question. Um, no, Amy, that was, that was great. I mean, I, I think I, I'm, personally more interested in augmented reality than virtual mm -hmm. reality just because I don't really like the headsets that, that mm -hmm. the, the VR headsets that much but I, I you know I expect all of that will, will change I, I also think that you know the tech sector is prone to prone to hype and uh, I think that um, the you know the, the metaverse is one thing but there's actually a lot of really interesting stuff happening with digital twins and and whether people mean what they mean by the metaverse is actually a digital twin so in the case of lost horizon that is replicating their their um, bristol venue in in uh, online basically not necessarily for vr um but you know uh, other kinds of platforms I, I i think that 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 that's um that that's an interesting avenue to continue to explore and, and think about there's some there's some really juicy questions I want to squeeze in from the um from the from the chat. Um, uh, Martin uh, asks, do you think that a focus on flashy new technology like VR can distract us from thinking about traditional publishing platforms, which are likely to have a much bigger foreseeable, are likely to be much bigger for the foreseeable future? Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely the case, and and you only have to look at um, the fact that the um, print book. Has um, has been doing so well in 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 recent years. However, I do think that um, one of the problems in the in the so-called traditional publishing industry is that they're not really thinking hard about new audiences. They're not thinking hard enough about um, 
underrepresented readers. They're not thinking about who's, who's going into a bookshop, who's going into a library, who is not being served um, by, by books in the, way that, in, in the way that they might be. So I'm, I'm really interested in, in um, thinking about where young audiences are actually going, where, where, are, where are their, you know, who's getting their eyeballs uh, and, and what, you know, I guess personally, I've got such a passion for reading and a passion for the written word that I'm really interested in trying to think about um, the presence of text in immersive environments and how and, and, and whether or not any of those digital environments are ever going to be any good for reading in. Certainly at the moment, they're not. The idea of trying to read something in the VR environment is really just gives you a headache thinking about it, let alone actually doing it. Um, so, so yeah, I think that was a bit of a mishmash of an answer. Sorry, there. I hope there was something useful in there. No, that's great. Thank you, Kate. Um, there's a couple more questions. I think we'll, we'll see if we can squeeze them in. Um, one of them is kind of slightly directed to Two Storm Jar, and Sophie is already in the chat uh, responding to that, which is great. But I wanted to kind of put it to you as a question as well. Um, uh, Josh asks, um, how has Storm Jar approached the myriad of uh, ethical concerns around NFTs? And especially the kind of the, the potential of promoting a technology like that could be little more than a financial pyramid scheme. Um, you know, that's quite a hot um, issue uh, that's quite being uh, brought up around NFTs at the moment. So I wonder, as kind of the amplified publishing, the kind of leaders in this space, how you feel about that kind of technology. Um, I don't really have an opinion about the about about NFTs because I, I feel like there's so much hype and so much kind of uh, noise around around them that I find it quite hard to parse. Uh, in talking to Stormjar, I think that they that, that they're thinking really hard about it as well, and that and that whatever they whatever they decide to do in that sphere will have you know ethical considerations backing it up. So, um, I, you know, I think that it's great to hear that that's in the chat and that Sophie and James are in the chat too, because I think that, that that is a conversation that will continue to, to take place. Um, it'd be good to turn the heat down a little bit on it, if possible. Um, you might notice that we didn't mention NFTs when we were talking about the project today. And that's part, that's part of why, is it seems just that word, those three little, little letters seems to make people's heads explode. Um, but for, you know, completely valid and interesting reasons. But, um, you know, all I can say really is stay tuned. 29th of April, all will be revealed. <laughs> That's the big one in the diary. Okay, I think we're going to have to draw it to a close there. So I want to say a massive thank you to Kate and Amy and to our interpreters, Sherry and Nikki. Um, for those of you out there still watching, you can get news on all our future talks by heading to watershed.co.uk forward slash studio by following us on at PM Studio UK on Twitter or at Pervasive Media Studio on Instagram or by subscribing to this YouTube channel while you're watching this chat. Um, next week's talk, uh, if I can just scroll down to my notes, um, is all about comment sections. So do you ever leave comments on the stuff that you watch, read and listen to? In this lunchtime talk, Sammy Jones, who's a Bristol and Bath creative R&D New Talent Fellow and PM Studio resident, is going to delve into the weird and wonderful world of internet comment sections. We're really excited for that one. I want to say a massive thank you for all of you for bearing with us today on the technical issues. Um, thanks for being here today. A reminder that we are back in the building, live from the building as of next week, along with our Open Studio Friday offering and First Friday, which you can find out all about on our website, watershed.co.uk forward slash studio. So we'll all, we'll, I normally would say we'll see you all same time, same place next week. But those of you that want to join us can come into the building as well. And hopefully we'll see you online or in the building next week. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.